Praise be Jesus Christ forever. And welcome to our fourth presentation on the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke's second volume, covers the time from Jesus' ascension into heaven to the missionary efforts of the early church. All of this in response to Jesus' command, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and know that I am with you always, until the end of time. In total, Acts consists of 28 chapters, divided into five major sections. In the first three presentations, we considered the first major section of Acts. Again, there are five sections. We've covered section one, and now we're going to section two. Section 1, the church in Jerusalem, chapters 1 to 5. And now we turn to the second major section, chapters 6 to 12, entitled, The Earliest Missions of the Church. And so as we begin, I invite you to open your Bibles and turn to chapter 6. Chapter 6 consists of 15 verses. It's somewhat brief. The chapter begins with a situation of hardship. The widows of the Hellenistic community are complaining because their needs are not being addressed. The needs for food, for clothing, shelter. These Hellenists are Palestinian Jews. In response to this crisis, the twelve apostles, the twelve as they are now called, remember after Jesus' uh, resurrection there were only eleven and then the, the apostles decided to bring that number to twelve and they chose Matthias. The twelve gather the community to search for a solution. The solution that is offered is this. Select seven good men of good reputation filled with the Spirit and with wisdom. Seven are chosen. Their names are recorded in verse 5 of chapter 6. Among them is Stephen, a man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. St. Luke writes, The apostles prayed over them and laid hands on them. This is the rite of ordination to this day where the bishop prays over the candidates and then imposes hands on their head. The remaining eight verses of chapter 6 present another tense situation. So the first one was hardship of the, some members of the community. Now in the remaining verses, there is heated debates with accusations leveled against Stephen that he is depreciating the importance of the temple, depreciating Moses and the law, and elevating this Jesus to a greater position than Moses. Verse 8 articulates the accusation against Stephen. This man never stops saying things against this holy place. 
and against the law. Stephen, to use a modern colloquial expression, is getting under the skin of his adversaries. Chapter 6 concludes with Stephen being apprehended and brought before the High Court, the Sanhedrin, with witnesses bearing false testimony. The core complaint is that Stephen is giving witness by his preaching and teaching to Jesus the Nazarene. They want him to stop. They want the disciples to stop talking about this Jesus. Earlier we saw the arrest of Peter and John and now Stephen. As I said, chapter 6 is, is a brief chapter. We turn now to chapter 7. Again, follow in your Bible with me. Chapter 7 is four times longer than chapter 6. It begins with Stephen's interrogation by the high priest. From verses 2 to 53, we have Stephen's discourse. <laughs> that's a lot. 2 to 53, that's 51 verses. But if you look at the 51 verses, there are two motiv motives in them. Two major themes. First, Stephen is pointing out that the children of Israel constantly reject God's chosen leaders. Constantly. You know, here God gives them a shepherd, a leader, and throughout salvation history, the children of Israel reject the prophets and Jesus. Second, St. Stephen recalls their rejection of Jesus, God's chosen one. And a misunderstanding they have about the temple in Jerusalem. You remember shortly before Jesus' death, how he spoke to the Pharisees. He said, this temple will be destroyed and in three days I will raise it up. And they were thinking that Jesus was talking about the great temple in Jerusalem that took many, many years to build. We are told that Jesus was talking not about the building, but about the temple of his body. Verses 57 to 60, if you turn to them now, we call the martyrdom of Stephen. Let's read those words together. The members of the high court, the Sanhedrin, cried out in a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed upon Stephen together. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses laid down their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell to his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. St. Luke masterfully draws a parallel between Stephen's trial before the Sanhedrin, witnesses giving false testimony, resulting in Stephen's conviction and execution. He takes that and compares that to Jesus' trial with false witnesses, unjust conviction, and execution on the cross. Jesus forgave his executioners as he hung upon the cross. Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. As we listen to this passage, verses 57 to 60, we hear Stephen asking the Lord Jesus to forgive those who are stoning him to death. The master, the disciple. St. Luke draws this beautiful parallel. We turn to chapter 8. There are 40 verses in chapter 8. Using the strongest terms, St. Luke begins chapter 8 with seven, several startling statements. <laughs> you know, if you read them carefully, reflect on them, they are shocking. They're startling. The first is that Saul consented to Stephen's execution. He himself did not stone, as far as we know, Stephen. But one might say that he uh, was complicit in Stephen's execution. They laid the cloaks at his feet. And he observed this. He watched this. He didn't protest it. But he agreed with it. That's startling. Then St. Luke tells us there broke out a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem. That word severe is very important. Not just the persecution of going after, but a severe persecution. And thirdly, St. Luke states that Saul was, dis was trying to destroy the church, entering house after house, dragging out men and women, and handing them over for imprisonment. Uh, Saul is determined to wipe out this new movement, this new way, this heretical way. St. Luke then turns our attention in verses 4 to 8 to Philip in Samaria. Now, verses 34 to 39, we listen to Gamaliel's warning to the Sanhedrin who are attempting to wipe out this movement. He says to them, have nothing to do with this new movement. If it is of human origin, it's going to burn out. But if it is from God, Gamaliel warns, you may wind up fighting God himself. Well, contrary to his warning, the authorities go after the disciples forcibly. And so they scatter. The unintended result of this scattering is that the faith is carried beyond Jerusalem. St. Luke says the paralyzed and the crippled are cured. And, to and those possessed of unclean spirits are free. So the work of the apostles, which continues the work of Jesus, now begins to go outward. Like one throws a pebble in the water. First the plop, small circle, and then the many circles, the ripple effect. Well, that's what's happening. Verses 9 to 25 are somewhat strange. St. Luke's inclusion of the passage involving Simon the Magician is at best confusing. But if we turn to another section of sacred scripture, the purpose of Luke's inclusion may become clearer. I'd like us to turn to Matthew 13. You know, Parts of Scripture shed light on other parts of Scripture. They help us to understand. Matthew 13 involves a parable that Jesus told. And the way I see it, this parable sheds light on this inclusion of Simon the Magician. You're familiar with this parable. 
It's the parable of the soul. St. Matthew writes, Jesus spoke to them at length in parables. Parables are short stories that drive home a point. Jesus said, a soul went out to sow seed. And as he sowed the seed, some fell on the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. Whoever has ears ought to hear. But then the disciples asked him, what, what, what does this parable mean? And Jesus went on to explain the parable. He said, the seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. And the evil one comes and steals away what was sown in the heart. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he ha it has no roots and will last only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxieties and the lore of riches choke the word and it bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. I believe St. Luke included this strange passage about Simon the, ma the Magician as an example of someone who has a vested interest in becoming a disciple. It is rooted in a desire for power and personal prestige. See, that's what Simon really wanted. He wanted to be somebody. He wanted power. Then he is chastised by Peter in verses 20 and tw to 22. May your money perish with you because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. Repent of this wickedness and pray the Lord that if possible, your intention may be forgiven. And there are those who want something. They're looking for something. To benefit them. You see this even today. You see it all the time. Uh -huh. you know, but discipleship means giving, not getting. Uh -huh. Generous giving. All the great saints giving. And it's not easy. It's not easy. So the wanting. I have a saying here at the parish that those who do the least for the parish want the most. Well, that's not good discipleship. We're called to give of ourselves. In the remaining verses, 26 to 40, we hear about Philip. You know, now Philip is one of the apostles. We've heard about James and John and Peter and, and Stephen. And now you know, we're dealing with Philip. Again, the church is moving outward. And in this case, Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. The spread of Christianity outside the confines of Judaism is part of God's plan, as expressed by St. Luke. In other words, the gospel is not just meant for the Jews. It is meant for all of God's people. That's one of the things we pointed out earlier. 
the universality of Luke's plan, huh? of Jesus' plan. And Luke is driving that home. So in his narration of Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch, St. Luke is demonstrating for us that God is looking to embrace all people. What is also expressed here is the role of the Holy Spirit in the Ethiopian's conversion. It's not because of what, of what uh, Philip was saying. It's the working of the Holy Spirit. A few evenings ago I was listening to a discussion on TV that co commented on some of the negative consequences resulting from a misinterpretation of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. The commentator spoke about that phrase that was used over and over again in the spirit of the Council. Many people were using that expression without ever reading the documents of the Council. One of the ideas, the misinterpretation, is that the church is mine, the church is ours. In the past, I often expressed my concern over the issue that a shift has occurred in worship from a focus on God to what I call a celebration of the self. No, I'm entertained. I feel good. It's what I get out of worship. This is directly contrary to the very nature of worship. Worship is directed toward God. If it's not directed to, toward God, it's not worship. Some hymns like, We Are the Church. I know people like some of these. We Are the Church and City of God, which I like, uh, City of God is reminiscent of the work of St. Augustine, but the way it's done seemed to suggest that the work, that the church is the work of man rather than the work of the Holy Spirit. No doubt, we participate in the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself told his disciples, go out. Make all disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. But we are not a substitute for the Holy Spirit. We are workers in the vineyard. Workers, laborers in the vineyard. We are not the prime strength in that the Holy Spirit is. In our next segment, we will consider part two of section two. We've done part one, the church in Jerusalem, now chapters one to five. Now we're in chapters six to twelve, the second session, the earliest missions of the church, and we've just covered one half of those chapters. When we come back the next time, we'll deal with the remaining chapters in the second section. Until then, keep safe and stay healthy. And may the blessings of the risen Lord be with you always. Amen.